Now we're going to go into our question period. So I'm going to just go through those questions and rapid fire and answer them. Um, the first question is from a board member. The association has a verbally abusive homeowner. He is verbally abusive to board members and workers that the board has hired. We have read Mulcahy's cheat sheet on tips for dealing with difficult people. What type and amount of documentation is sufficient for the association's attorney to draft a letter to the verbally abusive homeowner? Um, so really the first step would be to just try to resolve it by having the attorney send a letter to the owner. And I guess what I would just need to hear about is, I mean, I don't need to hear like a video recording or anything like that. I probably would just need to hear feedback from the receiver of the verbally abusive behavior. So if it's the manager or the board member, just send me an email outlining what's been happening and, um, you know, give me dates, times, you know, what occurred. And then I can look at that and come up with a plan as to how we want to structure sending a letter to the owner. Interestingly enough, um, we sent out a couple of those letters last week. Actually, we send out a couple of those letters every week, just so you know. And if the person is really abusive and difficult, what our firm will do is say, all communications now go through our firm. You do no longer have the right to communicate with the manager or the board member. And that works really well because we tell them that all communication needs to be in writing. And we really, we handle it from there so that the board member or manager doesn't have to take that abusive uh, behavior anymore. So what documentation, just give me a rundown as to what's been happening, the dates, you know, give me examples of things that this person has done and then we can craft a letter that um, addresses the issues. And if you want, we can also be the contact person for that owner going forward. Okay, our next question. Our board enacted as part of association rules that solicitation and electioneering on association property will not be allowed. This is used to squelch board candidates from any campaign activities beyond a single formal controlled meet the candidates night and candidates bi bi biography background statements submitted with their application to be candidates on the board. Um, does this association rule conflict with the Arizona Rise Statutes 33-1808, which states in part, notwithstanding any provision in the community documents, an association shall not prohibit door-to-door -door political activity, including solicitations of support or opposition regarding candidates or ballot issues, and shall not prohibit the circulation of political petitions, including candidate nomination petitions or petitions in support of or opposition to initiative referendum or recall. Okay, so does the rule that you have in your association saying that solicitation and electioneering on association property will not be allowed, does that conflict with Arizona law? It does appear that it does. Um, you know, it's kind of unclear under the statute whether this is for, you know, HOA business that, you know, we, we have to allow it. Um, this door-to-door -door political activity, or if it's on a more grander scale, which would be like a state, local, federal, federal, you know, election type thing. Um, here's one thing I can tell you just from being in the trenches for so many years. People do not like it when neighbors knock on their door and want them to sign a petition or, you know, hear for 20 minutes something about, you know, a political issue, whether it's an HOA issue or a state local, federal, whatever issue. And so I think that's gonna work itself out. People aren't gonna, you know, they're gonna say, please don't come to my door again, or they're just not gonna answer it. So I, I would be opposed to having your association continue with that rule because I do think it conflicts with state law. Okay, question three. What information is recommended to pass on to new board members when the current board members are retiring from the board? Hmm. Okay, I think a really good thing to do would be give them as a resource our firm's website, because we have a ton of information on duties and responsibilities of serving on the board. We have videos, we have cheat sheets on those topics, encourage them to attend these uh, live presentations that are virtual, or to watch the videos after the fact if they can't be with us here live. Um, I think what I would do is at the first meeting after the transition, um, just give them an, an update as to what are some pending issues that might come up during this next year. 
and offer to be available if they have any questions as they progress through the next year. Um, I know my association is just this Thursday gonna be putting in a new president. And I had a brief discussion with the, the incoming president about some of the dynamics in our community. What are some goals in our community? My thoughts on appointments for committees. Um, and you know, basically what I just said is I'm just here as a resource. If you have any questions, I'm still at the table. I'm still a board member, um, but you're get ready for a difficult job. This is not gonna be an easy year. And um, you know, here are some challenges that I faced when I was the president. And here's some mistakes I made that I wish I could take back and do differently. And I wish you luck and I'm, I'm here, you know, and I think that's the best thing you can do. The, the funny thing is, is, and this happened to me too, when I was coming in as president, I thought I knew better, right? I thought that when I came in as president, even with all my experience representing associations for so many years, one of my favorite board members, he's not on the board anymore, uh, an older gentleman who, you know, is in his eighties, he'd been on the board for like 15 years. And he tried to warn me on something like within the first two months of my presidency, um, like, hey, I think you might be taking a wrong turn on this. And I remember thinking to myself, no, I'm not taking a wrong turn. You know, this is, I, we need to be more transparent on this. We need to, you know, give this group what they want. And it ended up really backfiring on me. Um, and it, it didn't go the way I thought it was going to go. And so just recognize that just make yourself available to be there for that person and say, you know, here's some, here's my experience. Here's some things I wish I'd done differently. And here's the things that are going to come up in the next year. And I'm here if you need me. I think that's the best thing that you can do. Okay, next question. How do we resume enforcing CCNRs that have not been enforced over the last several or maybe many years? Landscaping is the biggest issue. There are requirements for minimum landscape components, but many are not in compliance. This detracts from our community and we wanna begin working to correct this situation. Oh, this is a tough question because we may be bumping up against um, an owner being able to argue that because we haven't enforced something that we've waived our right to enforce it. So just kind of as a, a starting point, my one recommendation I would say is you can enforce maintenance of landscaping because you know the grass is growing, the leaves are dropping you know, from trees and uh, things die on people's, people's property. And so what I would say is you can enforce making sure that the property looks nice and that it's well maintained. Um, but let's say that your provisions say that you have to have eight trees that are a certain type of tree on, on the property. And this person only has four trees and they're not on the approved tree list, but they've been there for four or five years or six years or 10 years or 20 years you're likely not gonna be able to legally mandate that they you know, change their lot to comply with whatever the guidelines say, the eight trees that have to be you know, a certain kind of tree. Um, so I think you need to look at this on a case by case basis. What you might wanna do is um, you know, have a community education program about, okay, it's so important for us to um, you know, continue to make sure our properties look nice and try to get voluntary compliance um, by giving suggestions on things that people can do. Um, and some things you can mandate, and then there's gonna be some things you may need to get advice on whether or not you can enforce it if you want to make somebody do something. Okay, we have a very troublesome condo owner who is challenging virtually everything that takes place to operate the HOA. And one of his inferences is that we do not have the authority to increase our dues by $15 a month, which is a 5% increase without approval of our owners. Should he foolishly choose to not pay the increase, according to our CCNRs, he is delinquent, which voids his right to vote. Now my question is whether that prevents him from attempting to gain a spot on the ballot or getting on the board since he cannot vote as an owner. Okay, so it sounds like you've got a gadfly. Sorry to hear that. Um, you know, the first thing I would say is look at your documents, see if that increase is allowable without a board vote. Um, you know, in my experience, it probably is because it's such a small amount. Um, but you should go to the section in the CCNRs that talks about increasing assessments, and you should make sure that the amount that you're increasing it is within the limitations that allows the board to increase without getting a vote of the membership. Um, if this person doesn't pay, 
and um, you know, even if it's just the 5% increase, they don't pay. Um, you'll have to look to see whether or not you can suspend the voting rights. Typically that's in the bylaws, possibly in the CCNRs. And then you'll wanna notify the owner in writing that their you know, right to vote has been suspended because of the delinquency. Now the question is, can they run for the board? Can this person run for the board if they're delinquent? So in my experience, yes, typically they can. You wanna look at your bylaws or your articles of incorporation to see if there's anything in there that says that you can't be a board member if you have a delinquency that's owed to the association. Most documents do not have that provision. So you're likely gonna to have to let this person run for the board. Okay, next question. The majority of remaining parcels in the subdivision yet to be built were subject to a foreclosure. And there was a trustee's deed upon sale transferring the property to another LLC. Is this new LLC owner now the declarant? So the class B rights in the HOA. Several feel that class B now no longer exists because the majority of parcels changed owners, thus no current declarant and then HOA meeting is needed to elect an HOA board. Um, it, it just really depends. I hate to say that on this, but it, I have to see what your CCNRs say. So a couple things to look for. Go to your CCNRs and see how declarant or developer is defined. Um, typically, unless there is an assignment of the declarant's rights, the declarant is no longer you know, gonna be a class B you know, member of your association even the person that you know, may have purchased the majority of the remaining parcels. Um, usually as part of, if there's a big chunk of parcels being transferred um, you know, as part of a trustee sale or maybe even as a short sale or something, usually there is an assignment of rights that's done. But with a trustee sale, that just means that you know, the bank was foreclosing and somebody else just picked up this land, the remaining parcels at a trustee sale. So it's very possible that they did not take the property with an assignment of benefits to be the declarant. So I'd go back and look at the um, definition of declarant and class B voting, see how they word it, see if this minority owner that just bought you know, a minority of the remaining, excuse me, a majority of the remaining parcels, see if they fall into that category. You're probably gonna need to reach out to a law firm that specializes in representing associations like our firm to get our opinion on it. And it's actually kind of important because sometimes the declarant doesn't have to pay the full assessment rate. They can um, amend the documents sometimes without approval of the membership. And you know they can, they will be controlling the board likely. So I think it's important that your association gets some advice on that. Question seven, looks like we're about halfway through the questions after this one. Our architectural committee is all board members. Can the committee still make decisions via email? Hmm, this is kind of a sticky wicket. I mean, I, a lot of times architectural committees and the board are the same in the association, especially when you don't have a lot of other people that are volunteering. Um, you know, when the architectural committee meets and make decisions and a majority of the board is making decisions by email, you know, that is an open meeting violation. Even though they're acting as the architectural committee, you still have, you know, a majority of the board making decisions. So. What I would recommend is just at your regular board meetings, review the architectural items as an agenda item and make your decisions during the open meeting at that time. If you are gonna make decisions as a board, you know, by email, it's, you know, the board slash architectural committee by email. Um, what you may wanna do, I mean, I'm not recommending that, but if, if from a logistical standpoint that your board doesn't meet as often as these applications are coming in, at the next regularly scheduled board meeting, you should um, read into the record, you know, what was decided and um, so that there's a paper trail with meeting minutes. Now, if you're gonna disapprove something that's gonna be controversial and result in a lawsuit for all, you know, please do it in an open board meeting, do that architectural disapproval in the open board meeting so that if you get sued, they're not gonna claim that you violated the open meeting law or that you, um, didn't read properly to make a decision on, on the architectural application. Question eight, um, if an owner complains about tenants in another unit, does the owner that complains have to provide their name? 
Um, okay, so I think what you're saying is, so an owner is complaining about the tenants and um, does the association have to provide the owner's name that's complaining? You know, it depends. There is a kind of a very strangely worded statute um, in the Condominium Act and the Planning Communities Act that says that when the association sends a violation letter to an owner, if the owner responds back by a certified mail um, to that violation letter, the association has to provide who witnessed the violation or who complained about the violation. So it's possible that, you know, if that sequence of events happens that you're going to have to give the person's name. Um, but, you know, really the kind of the key thing is, is that the response to the association's violation letter by the owner would have to come in to the association by certified mail requesting this. I mean, since this bill's been on the book or since this law's been on the books for at least a decade, I've only seen that less than five times. So it's kind of unlikely that would happen. Um, they could make a records request um, for any complaints that have been made against their unit. And I think that's fair game. They would be entitled to see that. So if an owner complained about them, um, you know, in writing, the association would have to turn that over. Okay, next question um, from one of my favorite clients. Good to see you here today. Um, objections to the notice of or an action taken at a meeting shall not be considered from a member who attended the meeting unless objections are made at the meeting. A member not in attendance may submit a written objection to the secretary within 10 days following the meeting. My question is whether this requires the posting of draft meeting minutes within 10 days. Okay, so you have a, a bylaw provision that's talking about making an objection after the meeting. So something happens at your meeting for your board and if somebody you know, is unhappy about it, um, you know, unless you object to it within 10 days following the meeting, apparently, um, you know, I don't know what that means. I guess it means that you know, you're okay with it. Um, so do we have to post the draft meeting minutes within 10 days to meet this section in our bylaws? I would say no. Um, this section, and I am familiar with your documents. You have probably too much stuff in your documents, in my opinion. Um, just too many nitpicky type regulations like this. Um, you know, and I guess there's no purpose, I guess I would say to this, because if somebody really objects to something that happened at the meeting, you know, they can bring it up at the next meeting, they can, um, you know, send a letter to the president of the association saying, hey, I'm a board member, this happened at the meeting, I think I'd like to revisit this again, or I feel uncomfortable with it after the meeting. Um, but there's nothing under state law that requires you to do this. And there's nothing under state law that would require you to get those draft meeting minutes to the board within 10 days. So if they wanted to object to something, they could. So I, I hope that helps you with this particular question. Question 10, what are the pros and cons of setting some utility and monthly bills on auto pay? It is difficult that we are reviewing invoices that are now from two months ago. So I'm all in favor of putting utility and monthly, regular monthly bills on auto pay. Um, as long as the treasurer is looking at the bills, um, even though they're on auto pay, there should be a summary given to the treasurer every month um, to make sure that we're paying our bill and that we're not overpaying or paying late fees or whatever. So I think that's fine. Um, what I would do is just set up the protocol for that at a board meeting and um, how it should be presented is either the treasurer or the manager should just let the board know that we're planning to do this and find out if there's anybody that has objections. Next uh, question would be, should financial summaries be put on the HOA website each month? Um, you're not required to, but I think it's a really good idea. Um, because as I said on the secrets to successful associations, the boards that are the most transparent and the boards that communicate the most have the fewest problems. And so if all that information is on the website for anyone to look at, if they're interested in the financials of the association, um, you know, I think that's great. Now, would you put bank statements on there? No. You might want to put your year-to-date your budget, your, you know, financial statement, which, you know, talks about assets and liabilities. Those would all be you know, appropriate things to put on your website that would help people if they're interested in, in seeing more information on the finances. Okay, three more questions. There is a five-member board that was just elected. 
The board agrees on the president, but none of the rest of the board members will take on the treasury and secretary position. What should we do? Okay, so you've got four people on the board who don't have, you know, a, an officer position, who don't want to do an officer position. Um, I think what I would do if I was looking at this situation is I'd look at the bylaws and see if the treasury, or treasurer and secretary, you know, if there's any limitations on it, like they have to be different people. Um, and then I would, I mean, obviously the perfect solution would be that of those four remaining board members that aren't the president, that we have two people, separate people step up, one be the secretary, one be the treasurer. If that doesn't happen, maybe you could get one person to do both jobs if your documents don't prohibit it. Um, typically, if you have a management company, being the secretary isn't that difficult of a job because they handle a lot of your things. So maybe the president can also serve as the secretary and then you'd only just need to find somebody to be the treasurer. I wouldn't recommend having the president be the secretary and the treasurer too, just because there's no checks and balances. So, um, you know, keep that in mind. If you're having difficulty getting people to step up, maybe you need to get our firm involved and we can have a meeting with the board and just remind everybody that, hey, you signed up for this. You, we need people to step in as the secretary and treasurer. Um, and I would look at the documents to see what kind of restrictions there might be in terms of can they hold the same position and um, does it have to be separate individuals, et cetera. Okay, next, we actually got one more question added. So we have three more questions. Our, eight, our CCNRs restrict renting our townhouses if the owner purchased the property after 2004. Some homeowners who purchased after 2004 are renting their townhomes and telling the HOA that they're letting their relatives live there for free. These owners knew the CCNRs before they purchased. What is an HOA to do? Hmm. It's always difficult to prove that somebody has a renter in the property. Um, you know, especially when they say, oh, it's our family that's being there. Um, you know, and that doesn't violate the rental provision. Well, it actually might if there's money being exchanged. So I think what I would do is I would have our firm send this particular owner or owners a letter um, asking for, you know, documentation as to who's in the property um, and pinning them down as to more specific information. Um, you know, oftentimes the renters, you know, they will talk to people at the pool or whatever. And so if anybody has a discussion with the renters and we find out that the stories aren't jiving, you know, we can send a letter to the owner um, regarding, you know, the information that we've been provided. Um, but I would say pin the owner down, make them put it in writing so that now if they're lying, we have something in writing that they're lying about. And you, I suppose you could knock on the door of the tenant and ask, you know, what is your relationship to the property, et cetera. Um, that's a little bit aggressive, but it's something that could be done. Um, oftentimes the neighbors, the direct neighbors know exactly what's going on. So you may want to ask them too. Okay, last two questions. What if someone volunteers for the board that you think will be a problem on the board? Mm -hmm. Yes, we see that often, right? Where somebody volunteers to be on the board and they've been a problem in the past and they're just worried that being on the board is gonna just be a nightmare. Well, there's really not much you can do, um, you know, in terms of prohibiting that person from being on the board just because they're difficult or, you know, they're not easy to get along with. If they get elected, you know, they are gonna be board members. Something to think about is sometimes when the difficult person gets on the board, they quit pretty quickly because um, they realize what a tough job it is. Um, I've seen that happen many times. Sometimes they change. And um, cause honestly, when I got elected to my board in 2016, I gotta say, I don't think our board really liked me because I had a little disagreement with them in 2016 prior to me getting on the board. But I think that everybody would agree now that I have stepped up and I've, I've been a great, you know, helpful board member wanting to make our community better. So sometimes people change and your perception of them may change. Um, if they're really difficult when they get on the board and you don't, you can't work with them, you could consider doing a removal petition. That's really divisive and kind of expensive for associations to do. So hope you don't have to do that. 
Um, but the bottom line is there's really not much you can do. Um, you know, just play it out, see how it goes, get advice from your trusted advisors if things aren't going well as to how you can best manage it. Um, the really difficult, another thing to do would be thinking about having a code of conduct for all the board members, including behavior at the meetings and behavior outside of meetings. Um, and we have a sample code of conduct in our uh, cheat sheet called uh, Board Member Code of Conduct on our website at mulcahylawfirm.com. Okay, another question. Some owners and board members think the HOA does not have jurisdiction or the right to require any architectural applications and written approval process regarding landscaping prior to changes being done. If the HOA doesn't require this and doesn't know what owner's plans are in advance and lets owners do whatever they want, what are liability ramifications for the board and the HOA? What if they plant something that's not keeping within the community? Um, can the HOA be seen as negligent? So I think what you need to do is have your attorney look at the provisions in your CCNRs on architectural applications and what needs architectural approval um, as, so they can make a final call as to whether or not this is something that the board you know, or the architectural committee does need to review before an owner makes changes. Um, so I think you need a formal determination on that. If that is not something that you can regulate um, through architectural process, then yeah, you kind of are stuck with whatever somebody puts in there. So I hope that's not the case, um, you know, because it's important to have uniformity and have everything looking nice. Regardless, you would have the right to um, enforce maintenance of the lot through the maintenance provisions. So if they install something that's not being maintained under like 100% of the documents in Arizona, you're gonna be able to make them maintain it to an acceptable standard. I really appreciate you being here today to learn more about association law and how to make your communities better, avoid problems, be successful, and set goals for 2022. I'd like to personally thank um, the neighborhood services departments from the cities of Avondale, Chandler, Glendale, Goodyear, Mesa, Peoria, Phoenix, Scottsdale, Surprise, and Tempe for your teamwork and continued partnership with the Mulcahy Law Firm to put together these amazing virtual classes for your residents. Um, we've been partnering together for these classes now since March, 2020, right when the pandemic first started. And our videos on our virtual HOA academies and other videos have seen over 50,000 views by people throughout the state of Arizona. And that's truly providing a great service, a place where they can come for free information um, about how to best run the HOAs and condominiums and get their questions answered for free. Um, if you've enjoyed this class today, I would like to just make a request that if you're so inclined, please uh, reach out and do a review on our firm on Google, Yelp, or Facebook. Um, it really helps us to get the, um, our rating higher on Google so that when owners are trying to find information on Arizona HOA and condominium law, our information pops right up so that we can assist them and um, hopefully answer their questions with our cheat sheets or our videos. Some quick update on our education plans for 2022. Um, we're still conducting our first Fridays where you can uh, dial in to our office virtually for our first Fridays free dial in or call in. And at that, you can ask a question at no charge. And that's always the first Friday of the month. Um, our next one is going to be the first Friday of um, February, which will be February 4th. Um, and we log on at nine o'clock and answer questions until they're all answered. Um, we're also looking forward to continuing our partnership with the neighborhood services from all around the Valley of the Sun in Arizona. For our virtual HOA Academy, we're going to be having those the third Tuesday of the month. We're going to be doing a virtual HOA Academy in 2022 in conjunction with all these different neighborhood services departments. In February, we have two online virtual classes in addition to our first Fridays. We have our second virtual HOA Condo Academy um, at 11 a.m. on uh, February 15th, and that's going to be going over what are board member roles and responsibilities. And then we're also going to be doing a special class for the Scottsdale Neighborhood College on uh, Wednesday, February 16th at 1 p.m., also virtual, on HOA and condo finances and how to read them, understand the budgets, 
um, et cetera. So that'll be an interesting class, especially for those of you who are treasurers who, or who want to keep a, a close watch on association finances. So don't forget videos of this class and all of their prior classes and cheat sheets can be found on our website at mulcahylawfirm.com. I hope everybody has a wonderful 2022. I wish your associations the best of luck. Please know that I'm here for you as a resource as you move through 2022. And I hope you all have a great rest of the week.